This feature of our lives can serve as the basis for the rights of protection against genocide, whether through deliberate or negligent means. After all, even though our interdependency constitutes us as more than thinking beings, even as more than acting beings, indeed as social, as embodied, as vulnerable and passionate, our thinking gets nowhere without the presupposition of an interdependent, passionate, and sustaining condition of life. It is, of course, one thing to claim this in the abstract and quite another to understand what the difficulties are in struggling for social and political forms that are committed to fostering sustainable interdependency on egalitarian grounds. When any of us are affected by the sufferings of others, we recognize and affirm an interconnection with them even, the, even when we do not know their names or speak their language. At its best, some media representations of suffering at a distance compel us to give up our more narrow communitarian ties to respond sometimes in spite of ourselves, sometimes even against our will to a perceived injustice. Such presentations can bring the fate of others near or make them seem very far away. And yet the kind of ethical demands that emerge through the media in these times depend upon this reversibility of proximity and distance. I tried to suggest at the beginning of my talk that certain bonds are actually wrought through this very reversibility. I want to suggest as well that we might find ways of understanding interdependency that characterize cohabitation precisely as these kinds of reversible bonds. I want to, of course, say that sometimes these bonds are wretched. One population is up against another in ways that feel unlivable. Modes of interdependency are exploitative or colonizing. This is surely the case in Israel-Palestine where the notions of a national home and homeland are inevitably implicated in relations of internal heterogeneity and adjacency, which bring up the issue of unchosen cohabitation in yet another way. As you know, Israel and Palestine are joined. They overlap. And through the settlements and the military presence, Israel invades and pervades Palestinian lands. Even if these two entities sought a full-scale separation from each other, the two would still be bound to one another by the separation wall, by the border, by the military powers that control the border. The relationship would only be extended in its wretched form. It would not be broken. There are settlements now in the West Bank populated by right-wing Israelis who nevertheless depend on local Palestinians for conveying food or menial jobs. And we might point out as well that the soldiers at the checkpoint are in constant contact with Palestinians who are waiting there or passing through. These are wretched forms of binationalism. <laughs> These are forms of contact, adjacency, unwilled modes of cohabitation that are not only clearly inegalitarian, but where the military presence is hostile, threatening, destructive. These are clearly different from the activist and weekly demonstrations at Bilin where many have suffered physical injury and death, the important, tr important triumph at Budris to steer the wall away from the olive trees, the persistent rallying of support in Sheikh Jarrah every Friday for those threatened with the confiscation of their homes and those whose homes have already been transferred to Jewish Israelis, the important engagement with Ta'ayush, Arabic for living together during the second intifada when medical supplies were illegally transported into the West Bank, the Israeli feminist activism of Mahsam Watch at the checkpoints dedicated to witnessing, chronicling, and opposing harassment and intimidation of Palestinians, or the work of Palestinian and Jewish Israelis together at Adala in Haifa, an organization surely worthy of receiving the Nobel, which has legally processed thousands of claims against Israel for the confiscation of Palestinian lands and the expulsion of Palestinians from their homes. I would include among these the boycott, divestment, and sanction movements, which now has an Israeli version, which stipulates that coexistence requires equality and cannot take place under conditions where one party is subjected to colonial subjugation and disenfran disenfranchisement. It is an Arendtian view, to be sure. These are but a few of the many insistent and important ways of practicing and thinking about cohabitation, alliance, modes of working together, sometimes working in separate venues against the illegal occupation and for dignity and self-determination. 
Over and against these instances of cohabitation, there are, we know, antagonistic ties, what I've been calling wretched bonds, raging and mournful modes of connectedness. In those cases where living with others on adjacent lands or on contested or colonized lands produces aggression and hostility in the midst of that cohabitation. Colonial subjugation and occupation is surely one way to live without choice next to and under a colonizing population. The mode of unchosen cohabitation that belongs to the colonized is surely not the same as the notion of a democratic plurality established on grounds of equality. And this is why only those forms of alliance that struggle to overcome colonial subjugation carry the trace of any future possibility of cohabitation between the inhabitants of that piece of earth. Otherwise, Palestinians remain disproportionately exposed to precarity and Israelis act to shore up their territory and majority rule through extending colonial control and heightening their modes of military aggression. I want to argue in closing that even in situations of antagonistic and unchosen um, conditions of, of cohabitation, certain ethical obligations emerge. Since we do not choose with whom to cohabit the earth, we have to honor those obligations to preserve the lives of those we may not love, we may never love, who we do not know and did not choose. These obligations emerge from the social conditions of political life, from precarity, and proximity, not from any agreement we've made, nor from any deliberate choice. These very social conditions of livable life are precisely those that have to be achieved or struggled for. We cannot rely on them as presuppositions that will guarantee our good life together. On the contrary, they supply the ideals toward which we must struggle. Because we're bound to realize these conditions, we are also bound to one another in passionate and fearful alliance, sometimes despite ourselves, but ultimately for ourselves, that is, for a we who is plural and constantly in the making. These conditions imply equality, but also an exposure to precarity. Equality, I take from Arad, precarity here from Levinas. And this leads us, I think, to, an understand, to understand as a global obligation imposed upon us, the task of finding political and economic forms that minimize precarity and establish economic political equality. Those forms of cohabitation characterized by equality and minimize precarity become the goal to be achieved by any struggle against subjugation and exploitation. They are also the goals that start to be achieved in the practices of alliance or cohabitation or ta'ayush that assemble across distances to achieve those very goals. We struggle in, from, and against precarity, and it is not only from pervasive love for humanity or a pure desire for peace that we strive to live together. We live together because we have no other choice, and yet we must struggle to affirm the ultimate value of that unchosen social world. That struggle makes itself known and felt precisely when we exercise freedom in a way that is necessarily committed to the equal value of lives. We can be alive or dead to the suffering of others. They can be dead or alive to us depending on how they appear and whether they appear at all. But only when we understand that what happens there also happens here and that here is already an elsewhere and necessarily so do we stand a chance of grasping the difficult and shifting global obligations in which we live, which make our lives possible, and sometimes too often impossible. Thank you very much. Of course, according to my paper, I'm radically unprepared for whatever comes at me. Yeah. So, please, any questions? 
question. My name is Teresa Kulavik. I'm teaching here. I have a German background, so I had the pleasure to listen to you in German uh, quite a time ago. Yeah. Um, my question, uh, I will bring your reasoning to a very different territory from the Palestine-Israeli space to modern medicine. Mm -hmm. While I was listening to you, I do research on reproductive technologies and selective practices prenatal screening, selective abortions. Your way of ethical reasoning about precariousness, about choosing with whom we are cohabiting, do you think it's applicable to these modern technologies? And if yes, how would you apply it to them? I know you have developed your reasoning with having genocide as the kind of a foil to think about it. Uh, the 